Okay, what I want to do in this video is take you through the cranial nerves. I want to go through the location of the cranial nerves, the names of the cranial nerves, the individual functions of each cranial nerve, and then also what can happen if there's a problem with those cranial nerves. What are going to be the symptoms? I'm going to start here up in the top left. I'm going to list out the cranial nerves. First of all, the cranial nerves are usually identified, identified by Roman numeral. So it would be CN1, CN2, CN3. CN1 is olfactory. CN2 is optic, CN3 is oculomotor, CN4 is trochlear, CN5 is trigeminal, CN6 is abducens, CN7 is facial, CN8 is vestibular cochlear, CN9 is glossopharyngeal, CN10 is vagus, CN11 is accessory spinal or spinal accessory, and CN12 is hypoglossal. A mnemonic that's often used to help you remember the cranial nerves is ooh, 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 to touch and feel very green vegetables. Ah, because then we're using the first letter in each word in the sentence to cue us to the first letter of the cranial nerves. Now, still, it's pretty difficult because it's hard to tell what the ooh, ooh, ooh is. And also, it's a bit dorky. So if you want something a little bit more lively, do a search for cranial nerve mnemonic, and you can find several mnemonics that are easier to remember, but I can't put them on a YouTube. Another mnemonic that, that is helpful is some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. What this does is it cues you to whether the cranial nerve is sensory, motor, or both. On our test, you're not really going to have to do that. You're not going to have to specify that. But it will help you remember that something like the trigeminal is going to have both a sensory component and a motor component. So that might be helpful. So again, olfactory is sensory. Optic is sensory. Oculomotor is motor. Jump down to trigeminal. And that's both. It's got both a sensory and a motor component. I'm going to start right here, because this is olfactory, and this is CN1, and that's a fairly simple one, because what it does is it helps you smell. And if you can visualize the sagittal section of a brain, these sit right over the nasal cavity, and so the olfactory nerves can go right through the roof of the nasal cavity and right into these olfactory bulbs. And so CN1 governs smell. If there's a lesion of CN1, you get anosmia, or loss of smell. It's also going to affect things like taste, so if somebody says they can't taste anything, it might be that they can't smell things because most of the taste is smell. Sometimes they can still smell painful stimuli like ammonia. This down here, it's called a chiasma because the Greek letter chi is X. And so this is called the optic chiasma, but it's where the optic nerve crosses. And we can learn more about why that crosses later, but this is CN2, the optic nerve. This is going to obviously carry vision from the eyes back towards the occipital. It's going to stop the thalamus and the lateral geniculate nucleus first, and then process back to the occipital cortex. If you have a lesion of, of CN2, you can have blindness in the eye that's affected. And it's going to be just peripheral vision that's lost. You can see this rather easily by just closing one eye. Because if you lesion an optic nerve, what is happening is you're not getting visual information from that eye back to the cortex. And that's the same as if you just close that eye. And what you'll notice is you just lose a slice of peripheral vision on the side of the eye that is closed. Things are going to get a little more complex now when we get to CN3 or ocular motor. One of the first things I should probably do is back off and talk about the muscles of the eye because the ocular motor controls four of the six eye muscles. The six eye muscles, I'm going to come up here. This is a picture of my daughter. This is the lateral rectus, moves the eye out. The medial rectus moves the eye in. The inferior rectus moves the eye down. And the superior rectus moves the eye up. Then you have these oblique muscles. And these are a little bit harder to understand because it's superior oblique because technically the muscle is superior to the eye. But when it pulls, it moves the eye down and out. And so I'm pointing this direction in the way that muscle moves the eye. The inferior oblique is actually below the eye, but when it contracts, it moves the eye up and out. Let me explain that a little bit with this figure. This muscle right here is the superior oblique. And notice that it comes along and it goes through something like a little pulley, and it grabs the eye on the upper surface. So it is the superior oblique because it is above the eye. But if we were to pull this muscle, it's going to rotate this eye down and out. So here I'm showing you the muscles and where they're located. Here I'm showing you what actions of the eyes are responsible for which cranial nerve, or governed by which cranial nerve. Coming back down here, the ocular motor controls the inferior oblique, the superior rectus, the medial rectus, and the inferior rectus. 
And if those muscles are lesion, then what's going to happen is generally there's a tug of war here. You're moving the eye in versus moving the eye out. The lateral rectus and the medial rectus are in this tug of war that keeps the eye balanced right in the center. If you think about this tug of war, if one side drops the rope, so to speak, then the eye is going to move out. And so if the medial rectus all of a sudden becomes paralyzed, then the lateral rectus will be unopposed and it will pull the eye out. Also, the superior oblique might pull the eye down, so the eye might move outward and down. The ocular motor also constricts the iris, and this is a parasympathetic function. And it also lifts the upper eyelid. So again, if I can come back to lesions, you might have this out and down deviated eye. You might have paralysis of the eye. The pupil might be dilated because you're no longer constricting the iris, and the eyelid might droop. It's a little hard to see the droop here, but you can see that her eye is definitely deviated out and it's definitely dilated. CN4, right down here, is trochlear. And the trochlear just controls the superior oblique. And most people won't really report a problem with the trochlear or CN4. Other people might notice that they're walking around with a head tilt. It's hard to describe on paper in this video, but basically if somebody is trying to look down and out, and they can't because the trochlear is lesioned, then they'll tilt their head a lot to see things that are down and out. And so they'll tilt their head. Patient can also report double vision because one eye might be able to look in that direction, the other eye is paralyzed and can't. At that point, both eyes are looking at different things, and so you're going to get double vision. And as long as we're talking about that, you can get double vision with a CN4 lesion, a CN3 lesion, and a CN6 lesion. And again, that's because one eye can move, the other eye is paralyzed, all of a sudden the eyes are looking at different things, and you've got double vision. A large nerve right here is the trigeminal. And it has both sensory and motor functions. It governs sensation of the face, and it also controls muscles of mastication. In fact, the sensation, there's one of the branches, and we're not going to go into the specific branches, but one branch covers the roof of the mouth and the back of the throat, and another covers the forehead. And it's not a very good neuron in the sense that you can get some cross-reactivity if you stimulate one. You can't really locate where that stimulation, stimulation is coming from. So if you eat very, very cold ice cream, and you stimulate the branch that's in the roof of your mouth, you'll actually transfer that pain to the other branch that's governing your forehead and you'll feel that as brain freeze. But if you've got a lesion, you might have numbness of the face, paralysis and deviation of the jaw to the side of the lesion. The reason you get deviation to the side of the lesion should be upon protrusion. It's because if you try to protrude your jaw and one side is not protruding, then you'll push the jaw to the side that's not protruding. It's kind of like if you're in a car, and if one set of wheels is on gravel, and the other side is in concrete, the fact that the right side can't push as well as the left side because there's less traction means the car is going to swerve to the right. So if the left side of the jaw is pushing forward, and the right side is not pushing forward because it's paralyzed, then the jaw is going to move to the right. You're going to get a rightward deviation of the jaw to the side of the lesion. It's always good when you're trying to memorize these to remember the location or remember some hallmarks. Like trigeminal is a large nerve, and C and 6 is right back towards the middle. So this middle one is always going to be C and 6, both sides. C and 6 is the abducens, and that only controls the lateral rectus. So if we come back up to Ella, this is the lateral rectus, and it moves the eye outward. We're going to go back to that kind of tug of war, that normally the eye is balanced right in the middle, because there's a tug of war between the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. If the lateral rectus becomes paralyzed, it's like the lateral rectus is dropping the rope in this tug of war. The medial rectus is going to be unopposed, and so the eye will deviate in. And this is an example of a patient with a medial deviation of the right eye because she has a lesion of her abducens nerve. 